Yo guys, so last year IBM contacted me and challenged me to embed AI into a drone and having done only one rather simplistic hardware project up until that point, it was a really hard challenge but was also a lot of fun to try and figure out and learn how to solve the problem proposed. And guess what? IBM has slid back into my DMs with another challenge and right off the bat I am really excited. Collaborations with IBM developer for me has become a beacon for unlocking new potential within myself as a developer. And just to be completely transparent with you guys, yes, this video is sponsored by IBM. So what's this new challenge you ask? Well, this is the second year IBM and their partner organizations are holding a global developer challenge called Call for Code, in which the idea is to develop some software or hardware solution, or both, that could potentially save lives. So, kind of like a game jam or hackathon, but with saving lives as the theme. Which, being such a huge company that they are, I am very happy to see that they have such initiatives. Putting down massive amounts of money and resources to call on developers like you and I to use our coding superpowers to try and contribute to making the world a better place. And so, IBM hit me up wondering some ways we could promote this initiative together. And I replied, why don't I just try my hand at entering the contest myself? I mean, after all, first place project will win $200,000. But also, IBM just launched a new initiative called Code and Response, in which the top projects from Call for Code 2019 will get assistance from IBM to take their projects into production. And so, with that preface, let us begin. Now, let's get the first obvious question out of the way. So, you mean to tell me that you're going to build an application that can save lives by yourself in only a couple of weeks. Right. <laughs> no, not at all actually. Sure, I may be lazy, but I'm no fool. I know that something like this is a very, very long game. There are so many moving targets to try and hit when trying to solve problems as big as potentially life-saving. Anywho, the very first step was to try and identify a problem that I wanted to solve that could potentially save lives. And this in itself, <laughs> was a really difficult challenge. It took me many shower thoughts to land on this, but this is the problem that I pitched to IBM that I wanted to try and solve. <laughs> now, bear with me. The way I like the concept is by shooting for the stars and see where you land. So, imagine you're in the middle of some crazy storm or something, and in front of your path to safety is an unexpected flood with what looks to be a not so deep, calm moving body of water. Now, you could just turn around and lose all the progress that you've made, but you're really in the moment and really just want to get to safety. And so you say, ah, what the hell, this water isn't even that bad. And so, you try to drive across it. But, the flood turns out to be more dangerous than you realized, and boom, just like that, you're now stuck on the top of your car because you had inaccurate data. And this is where I'd like to introduce Project Safe Waters. Project Safe Waters is a program that you'll be able to point at any body of water and it'll be able to predict the depth of the body of water that's centered on screen, along with the traveling speed of the body of water, its direction vector, and its overall threat level. And this was my idea for IBM's 2019 Call for Code initiative. Now, how does one expect to create such a program? Well, let's just say we have a lot of work to do. You see, I plan to train a neural network to learn from the patterns within some data to accurately enough predict its threat level. Now, if we want this neural network to be able to generalize many different weather and geographical conditions to be intelligent enough to actually help save lives, we'll have to gather millions upon millions of images with varying conditions. And every last photo must have a label. I mean, think about it. If we're just using a single camera as inputs for Project Safe Waters, well, there are so many different variables to consider. Just take weather for example. There's rainy, there's sunny, there's cloudy, there's snowy, then there's a bunch of different lighting conditions like day, night, dusk, dawn, car lights, street lamps, not to mention the various forms that bodies of water can take like this or this, this one, that one, these. <laughs> Again, we really have our work cut out for us. But again, I think it's a really important note to stress that even though I believe highly in my skills as a developer, I'm not even sure if I have the ability to develop this app as I've dreamt it up to be, or how possible this solution even is for this problem. But regardless of the fact, we're going to give it a shot anyway. 
Because I think if you persistently aim for some grandiose idea, you're guaranteed to eventually fall somewhere in that general direction. And so with that, let's officially start developing. Now, the very first thing that needs to be done is to figure out some sort of plan of attack. Because without this, everything will fall apart and very quickly. Especially when dealing with anything machine learning related. And so to do that, we have to first ask a lot of questions. Are there any pre-existing labeled flood data out there? Are there a lot of photos of floods on the internet? How long per image would it take for me to label these photos? At what rate could I gather my own original flood data? And after a little while of researching, I got some answers to these questions. No, yes, two years if I guess labeled the photos, and a very, very long time. And so, how are we going to go about getting enough data in a reasonable amount of time to test if this idea even has any value? I mean, of course, we could go out with a camera and a measuring stick collecting data on different bodies of water, but this is a really bad idea. Because, one, I don't even know if this overall idea will work, and investing a month of time to get a couple thousand photos doesn't interest me. And two, trying to collect enough varied data to solve this problem alone will take me years, even decades perhaps. And three, I live in Southern California where it sprinkles, the water that falls from the sky here does not count as rain, sprinkles, maybe five times a year if we're lucky. So yeah, that approach gets a big no from me. Now of course, there are already images of floods that exist on the internet, and I'm sure I could easily collect more than a million of them simply by using web crawlers. But there is a huge problem with this approach as well. As I've mentioned, it took me almost two years to label every single photo just by looking at them and quickly guessing, and over 16 years to research a better approximate answer for every single photo. Trust me. I've timed this. But an even bigger issue to this approach, I am far from a flood expert. And if it's up to me to look at over a million photos of floods and guess level their depth, velocity, vector, threat level, etc., then we're doomed. I could end up training a neural network with the opposite effect of what I wanted to achieve. My inaccurate guess labeling could end up putting people in some very dangerous scenarios if Project Safe Waters were to be deployed. That is why it's really important to have incredibly accurate labeled data for the data set that I'll be using for training. But here's the thing. There is no way around this. This data set of millions of flood images with labels will have to be created one way or another if I want to use current machine learning approaches to solve this problem. Be it by myself taking over 16 years or putting together some crowdsourcing effort. It will have to be done. But before we commit to such a major initiative, I think it's a good idea to at least be able to know if this is even worth our time or not. And so to get an answer to this, we can use one simple industry trick. And what is that trick you ask? Well, we can create a simple simulation that is realistic enough to be able to take in-sim photos, essentially generating a simulated data set with labels for us, quickly and effortlessly. Then we can feed that data set into a neural network for it to train on. In fact, while we're at it, let's pause for a second and configure what I like to call a ladder, in which we will start where we want to be and work backwards figuring out the steps to get there. Then we'll simply just climb up our ladder to make some progress. Now I put together a pretty complex ladder for the entirety of Project Safe Waters. But for this video, we're just going to try and climb up the first ladder. And so at the top of this ladder, we have the goal of training an accurate enough neural network based on data from a simple simulation. Not too challenging, shouldn't be too hard. But in order to get there, we need to get convincing enough results from testing. But in order to do that, we need to train a neural network that converges. But before we can train any model, we need to obtain a bunch of data with labels. But in order to do that, we need to create a realistic enough flood simulation environment. And so that's where we'll start. Now, I started off pretty foolishly. I thought that for whatever reason, I needed to simulate every droplet of water for the simulation. And so I started off using Nvidia Flex with Unity 3D, which is a beautiful, robust liquid and cloth simulation API published by Nvidia. But after many hours of trying to get the liquid to be less like viscous honey and more like water, I learned that it's just not not possible with this API. In fact, I learned that simulating water is actually a really big deal. There are actually some papers that are working on trying to address this. The processing power that is required to simulate water is just too high. 
So I give up there and try to use the liquid simulation in Blender, but quickly stopped looking into this once I realized that I wasn't in the mood to learn how to use Python scripts in Blender yet. Completely stumped on what to do next, I started over from a completely different approach. Using Unity 3D, I grabbed their Windward City demo environment and thought about how I could flood this city. And that is when a brilliant idea popped into my head. Why not just use a simple blue plane? <laughs> Relax, relax. This isn't actually brilliant at all, it's actually pretty industry standard, and I'm not gonna keep it like this. You see, most water in video games are usually just a plane with an animated texture on it, so to speak. And so, to make this training data as real as I can for now, I purchased a pretty cheap water shader on the Unity Asset Store for $10, applied it to our plane, and I'm pretty happy with it. It looks pretty realistic if you ask me. Write a realistic enough flood simulation environment? Check. Next, I need to create a photographer that can jump around the city taking pictures of the flood and labeling how deep the water is. And I achieved this by simply creating an avatar, attaching a camera to it to simulate a cell phone view, then shoot a raycast down from the sky, and if that raycast point is within a certain height range, and if the water that the camera is pointing at isn't too deep, then, we take a picture of that body of water, label it, then use it as data. Then we jump to a new spot and repeat that process. Pretty simple algorithm. Oh, and you want to know the details of the algorithm that labels the water's depth? Well, don't worry, because I've got you covered. We simply start by removing the layer of water, shooting a raycast straight from the center of the camera to the ground it's pointing at. Then we store the Y value from that 3D vector location as Y1. Next, because the water is a single plane across the entire map, we simply just take the Y value from the water's plane, Y2, and now we have the height of the water and the height of the ground that's below it. So now we just have to do a simple equation of Y2 minus Y1 and that will give us our depth. Otherwise, if the water isn't higher than the ground, then this isn't a flood. Oh yeah, and I also had to do a bit of metrics normalizing. So that's converting our game world metrics into our real world metrics. But yeah, math and logic, fun stuff. And now that our simple simulation is complete, all I have to do is just punch in that I want 10,000 images and sit back and relax with a bag of candy. A few minutes later and I now have 10,000 generated flood images with labels and I am ready to begin training. Obtained a bunch of data with labels, check. Now comes the part I have been dreading for quite some time and I'm talking well before this video and that's writing my first convolutional neural network. You see, 9 out of 10 convolutional neural network tutorials that you'll find on the internet uses a little data set called MNIST, which isn't the biggest deal, except when you download this data set, it's given to you already in pixel values, which can be a real pain to try and figure out how to use your own data set with Python and its dependencies. Having less than two years of Python experience under my belt, MNIST tutorials aren't the friendliest user experience for new users like myself. But another reason why I've been dreading this is because I don't have the strongest intuition when it comes to convolutional neural networks. I've done next to no research on these things, and I have a lot to learn. But here goes nothing. I started by downloading just your basic MNIST convolutional neural network script from GitHub, and just start to tweak it to get it to work. I was using Python and Keras if you're interested. Two days later of R&D and whatnot, and I finally got the convolutional neural network working properly and ready for me to feed it some input. And so, that I did. However, the images that the simulation generated were HD resolution, so 1920 by 1080. But if you do the math, that's over 6 million pixels per image. And if we times that by even a data set of 1000, that's 6 billion pixel values. And as far as I understand it, we'd have to store all 6 billion plus pixel values into the RAM of our GPU, which I'll tell you now, just is not gonna work. By my calculations, that should be somewhere in the hundreds of gigabytes. So our data needs to be compressed if we want any shot at this, yes? I know it's a lot to do, but bear with me. And so the first thing that we can do to compress our data is to turn our images into grayscale images. Instead of having RGB color values per pixel, we can just use a single brightness value per pixel, reducing each image from 6 million pixels per image to 2 million pixels per image, one third the amount of data, a bit better, but still a lot of information for your modern GPU to handle. 
Next thing we need to do to compress our data is to reduce the size of the images. If we reduce both the height and width of the image to 10% of the original, then we will reduce the pixel count per image by a factor of 100, making it now a little over 20,000 pixels per image. And the last thing we can do is just watch how many training samples that we use so that we don't overload the GPU. And I just started with 20 samples just to make sure everything was working right. Let the training begin. Eventually, the training model reached a low cost, or what most people like to call loss, but hashtag make optimization cost again. But anywho, this is considered a converged model. So train a model that converges, check. And this performed okay. Here are the metrics that I'm deciding to use to measure the success of the neural network. The first variable is average error. This is essentially how far above or below the neural network is with predicting depth. The second is the on-target variable, which I've decided that I'm okay with the neural network being at least 1.2 inches off with their predictions. I believe that 1.2 inches of water is not a noticeable difference, for you can walk in 1.2 inches of water with no problem. So, so long as the prediction is plus or minus a 1.2 inches margin of error, then it is 100% accurate to me. Then the last metric is the same concept as before, but for 6 inches, which I personally think is completely unacceptable. I mean, just grab a ruler and see how high 6 inches is. I just think that it could help with measuring the improvement of the model, but by no means will I be using it as an official measure of success. And here is how the 20 sample model did. It had an average error of about 22.7 inches inches when I tested it on 1,000 unseen images from our simulation. It only predicted about 4.6 of the images on target and 21% under half a foot. Now just looking at this data by itself, what do we know? <laughs> we know that it's performing extremely bad and that at the moment this is not proving to be a good idea. For all we know, this neural network can be completely randomly guessing and these results are just results of luck. Although not completely true because when we ask it to predict on the data that it's been trained on, you can see that it gets close enough estimates but doesn't overfit. And so to further test this approach, I then trained a new 100 sample model. The results for that model that was tested on the same 1000 unseen images as a 20 sample model was able to get an average error of about 19.2 inches, improving the average error by almost 16%. It labeled 5.1% of the data on target, improving the on target prediction by almost 11%, and it labeled 28% of the new images under an error of 6 inches, improving this by 33%. I expected this model to perform poorly feeding it 20 and 100 training samples. But seeing these small amounts of improvement simply correlated to the amount of training samples that we feed it was all that I needed to see to make me a believer. Get convincing enough results from testing? <laughs> kinda check, I'll give that a 50% opacity check mark. It's like I'm thrilled at what I see, but I would like more results before I start feeling really confident. And just for consistency, here's how the 100 sample model performed when we asked it to predict on the data that it was trained on. Again, pretty good, it didn't overfit. Anywho, these results led me to believe that if we fed it even more samples, ideally the model should see even greater gains. But of course, there are other things that we can do to help the model generalize and improve as well. But for now, more data. I tried to train the neural network on even more samples, but I started to run into GPU memory allocation problems, which at the moment is something I only have a little understanding of. I still haven't quite figured out how to get around this with Keras and TensorFlow yet. But again, the idea is that you have a GPU with a fixed space for allocated data. Then, when you have some mass chunk of data that you need to squeeze into that limited space of your GPU, I believe that this is done by chunking your data then spoon feeding your GPU chunk by chunk. Now, I was ready to end this project here for now, but then hope arrived as the glimmer of an angel by the name of Nick. You see, I submitted this very video to IBM, and when they seen I was having troubles with my GPU, they were like, Whoa, hold up Bubba, you were having GPU problems and didn't even tell us? We're IBM baby, we've got GPUs for days, besides, 
Using IBM services is a requirement for this competition anyway. And that's when I was connected with their machine learning computer vision addict, Nick Bordakis, who was actually in the middle of building a machine learning interface for IBM servers. He helped me process all of my 10,000 images and convert my model to work with IBM infrastructure. He even wrote a couple of scripts to help save me from some headaches, all of which are included in the GitHub repo in the link in the description. Nick, you're a real one, man. But once his conversion process was over, I finally trained on my 10,000 images. And after about an hour or so later, my model was done training. Now, before we look at the results, we need to quickly go over the new output labels that happen in the script conversion. So to train using IBM GPUs, we had to use what IBM calls buckets for our output. Instead of using a single floating point value as our output, we now have five buckets, which are ankle deep waters, knee deep waters, waist deep waters, floating deep waters, that just means that you float in the water and your feet can't touch the ground, and dangerously deep waters. And here's how the IBM algorithm trained on 10,000 samples performed on the same data that it was trained on. Just by looking at it, it did really well. Oh, you wanted me to go into detail on how to read this? <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, I got you. So this is what's called a confusion matrix. And confusion matrices are often used to visualize the performance of machine learning classifiers. On the left, we have our ground truth, AKA the actual answers or labels. And on the top, we have our model's prediction. This information will be important in a second. Just hang tight. Now, we can tell the performance of our classifier by looking at how often the prediction matches with the actual label, which, if you were to take a look at the confusion matrix, it should create a backslash diagonal line down the graph. Now, what do the numbers represent? Well, simply put, the numbers represent the percentage, from 0% all the way to 100%. But there is only 100% in our ground truth, or each row, because our ground truth is calculated using the exact number of images per label, while our predictions are just trying to predict the number of images per label. It may not be correct. Therefore, this can't make up 100% of the images. Now, in a perfect world, what we want this confusion matrix to show is a strong dark blue diagonal backslash line. Kinda like this. But, of course, Utopia only exists in one's mind. Now, we could just stop here at this confusion matrix and think about what this visualization says about our model, but I'm gonna give you a confusion matrix that's just a bit better and has a bit more information in it. Check this one out. Now, it may seem like there's a lot going on with this new graph, but don't worry, I promise it's the same thing going on with just a couple extra bits to it. So here in the center, or whatever, it's pretty much the same thing that we just went over, except instead of showing the percentages, it now shows the actual counts of images. Oh yeah, and the color map has also been normalized to the highest count by our model's prediction. These two axes here simply just add up the number of ground truth photos and the number of predictions. And this last axis is for precision and recall. Now precision simply means if we were to give our models predictions decision making power, how accurate would it be with making decisions? And so looking at all the predictions on the top, we can follow those down to the bottom to see how precise our model was with predicting each and every label. And these numbers are percentages to 100. Then finally, we have the recall. And the recall is measuring a different question. For all the actual labels in our data set, how accurate was the model with getting those correct? And these are also in percentages up to 100. And if you're confused about the difference between these two, imagine this quick example. You send your robot off to the swap meet and tell it to bring back 26 bananas. Well, your robot goes to the swap meet, it doesn't quite know what bananas are, and so it just grabs all the fruit it sees. And so when it brings you back the fruit, you can do a confusion matrix on it and you'll find that it has a 100% recall. It grabbed 26 out of 26 bananas, but its precision is quite terrible because it also grabbed 40 apples, 200 grapes, and 12 watermelon. That's a good example how you distinguish the two. Okay, now that we're on the same page with the confusion matrix, let's start doing some data analysis. First thing, the colors. If we take a look at the total ground truth column, we can see that the label dangerously deep is definitely underrepresented in this data set. I think that adding more representation here might improve our model a bit, but at the same time, if you look at the total predictions row, we see that the colors are kind of on par to each other, meaning that the prediction distribution is pretty close to 
its actual representation within the data set. Another color observation is it seems that the more shallow the water gets, the less accurate the model's predictions get. Another observation, on this side of the line, it shows us if the model is overestimating the water's depth, which is what we prefer, and on this side of the line, it shows us if the model is underestimating the water's depth, which is what we do not want. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'd much rather a model tell me that a water is deeper than it actually is than to tell me that it's shallower than it actually is. And last observation, it appears that our recall is better than our precision, which I do not mind. I mean, of course, I'd rather our model be precise and have good recall, but if I had to choose one, I'd much rather our model catch all instances of deep water instead of being extremely precise. However, at the fact that it's currently leaning towards underestimating water depths, I don't know how helpful high recall is in this instance. But yeah, that's the amazing power of data analysis. From this super simple graph, we were able to visualize data in a bunch of different ways to derive a bunch of analyses from it. But, 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 of course, this is only the training data that it's seen many times before. How does it perform on data it's never seen before? Well, here is a sample of 500. Not bad. And here is a sample of 1,000. And yo, not bad at all. And so, get convincing enough results? Check. Which means that we've also successfully trained a neural network based on data from a simple simulation. Abarabinga. Now, a little over 70% is okay by most standards, but there is still so much that we can do to improve our neural network. For starters, even though we fed the network 10,000 samples, we can still feed our network even more data. The domain space for this problem is actually quite large after all. More data would just help it figure out its domain. Not to mention, how noisy is the data? For example, this should not be in my training data set. Why are you here? Let's just delete that. You didn't see anything. Does the input to output relation I'm asking the model to try and solve even make sense? Is there a better way to encode this relationship? These questions are the reason why research and development takes so long. You've got to answer all these questions if you want to build something impactful. And so for now, this project is over. And I'm not sure what the future holds for Project Safe Waters. I don't know if I'll follow this video up with a part two because I have a lot of ideas that I want to explore. However, don't forget about IBM's call for code, and boy do I have some good news for you. So maybe you want to enter this contest, but you're not exactly sure what idea you should work on to enter into the contest. And I completely understand. Hell, it took maybe a week or two just for me to think of this solution myself. But check it out. You just helped me develop Project Safe Waters in spirit, so do you know what this means? This project is part yours as well. Why not enter the contest using Project Safe Waters? Here's the open source code, and you now have everything you need to pick up where I left off. There's nothing in the rules that say we can't start from the same GitHub repo, but if you can think of your own unique solution that is potentially life-saving, that's fantastic. I encourage you to give it a shot and enter. What you got to lose, huh? And if you need even more convincing, the contest ends July 29th, so you've got some time. But the winner each year gets a pretty sweet deal. First place project will win $200,000. But also, IBM just launched a new initiative called Code and Response, in which the top projects from Call for Code 2019 will get assistance from IBM to take their project into production. Visit ibm.biz slash jabrilcfc to register and get $200 worth of IBM cloud credits for six months instead of 30 days. Last year's winner was Project Owl, a solution that aims to keep victims connected to first responders in the aftermath of a natural disaster. And of course, they've won $200,000, but also help from IBM to test and deploy Project Owl in Puerto Rico. But you don't have to take it from me. IBM developer put up a crazy cool inspiring documentary on this. Please check that out in the description for some r slash inspo.